I'm honored today to be joined here by Joanna Lumley. She is a two-time BAFTA winning actress for her role in the long-running television sitcom, Absolutely Fabulous. She has also appeared in films such as Shirley Valentine and The Wolf of Wall Street. Alongside her illustrious acting career, she is a prominent advocate and human rights activist for Survival International and the Gurkha Justice Campaign. Joanna, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's such a privilege, Margie. Thank you very much for having me. I want to start right at the beginning by talking about your early life and how that prepared you for acting. So you were born in India and you were raised in Kent. Um, what was your childhood like and at what age did you know you wanted to be an actress? Well, my, tr my childhood was per peripatetic because although I was born in India, I was born the year before um, the independence of India. And so I left before I was even one year old. I've been back many times, of course, but my father was in the army. So we followed the regiment around the world and he was with the Gorkha regiment. And so first of all, we went to Hong Kong where I spent some years as a child and then to Malaysia as it is now, it was called Malaya then during the emergency. And I got back to England and went to boarding school when I was eight. But it was actually when I was seven, I think, in what was the army school in Kuala Lumpur, that I was asked to play a queen in a school play. My mother made me a blue satin dress and a little cardboard crown. And I thought I looked fine. And I was quite uh, confident until I got onto the stage. And then I turned to jelly, but got through it. And although my heart was absolutely beating, I had the strangest premonition that this was where my life would be tangled up with sort of anxiety and worry um, and fear, but the also the rush of adrenaline and the joy of entertaining an audience because to see a mass of faces out there who then react to what you're doing, I thought this is just wonderful. And I was a bit of a show off and a bit of a clown anyway. So it seemed to me being extremely lazy that that would be a wonderful way of earning a living. So was that kind of a very smooth progression, straight kind of doing various bits of acting and then becoming an actor, or Ooh. were there many ups and downs in the way? Ooh, if only it was such. Um, I was in all the school plays because I loved it. And I used to start, I started off obviously learning Porsche when I was about 10, but when I got taller, and I was, I'm five foot eight, but I was about to say five foot six at school, but nevertheless taller than quite a lot of girls. And so I'd get the men's parts. And I can remember playing Petruchio in the school play and just thinking with a light moustache and a little beard and, and, and a nice sort of, um, you know, thigh smacking the leg and behaving in a kind of Petruchio-ish way. And I thought, if this will be easy peasy, I'll li literally leap out of school. I took... I thought um, I would join a drama school. So I, I enrolled to do an audition when I was 16, still at school, and went up to RADA in London because my school was down in Hastings in Kent, in Sussex. And uh, they quite rightly failed me. I, after I'd said about 17 words, they just said, thanks, and that was it. My, oh, oh, I thought, this is awful. What if I go to another drama school and they turn me down, then I can never be an actor. So I just thought, I'll push that away. I'll get into it some other way. I drifted up to London. But Mahi, this was the 60s. Now, you're, you were, this is ancient history to you, but in those <laughs> days, it was alive and fast. London was, it seemed to be the center of the world for music, for fashion, for politics, all kinds of scandals were unraveling. And, um, it was very easy to fall into some sort of job. Everybody seemed to get a job. You could do a job doing anything. You could be a shop assistant or you could work as a waiter or whatever. And I somehow drifted into being a photographic model, which I sort of loved because it was, again, sh dressing up and showing off. We did all our own makeup. We did all our own accessorizing. So you had to bring along our own makeup, obviously, which we had to do, do our own hair and bring our own wigs. We had to paint our own fingernails and do our faces. We had to bring along tights and gloves and bags and sweaters. We had to bring jewelry, everything. We had to bring with us and put it all on. And so for three years, I worked really hard at that. I was lucky to be successful and to travel to virtually every country in Europe doing photographs, working hard here, but it wasn't really what I wanted. And I couldn't think, I thought, God, I've suddenly become a model. I'm not a model, I'm useless at modeling. I don't want to do modeling, I want to be an actress. Quite by chance, at a party, I saw in the corner a really handsome Shakespearean actor called Richard Johnson, who was riding the crest of the wave at the time. And I sidled up to him and said, Mr. Johnson, I wonder if you can help me. I'm only a model, but I want to be an actress and I don't know how to do it. And he said, you have to speak some lines in a film. If you speak lines in a film, you'll get your equity card. Now in those days, 
everybody, if you worked in an industry, had to belong to a union, and equity was the union that you had to belong to if you were going to act. He very kindly put me into the film he was making at the time, and I had one line, yes, Mr. Robinson. And when I'd said, yes, Mr. Robinson, I got my equity card, and suddenly I was free. I was an actress with an equity card. It was the most thrilling time. I was about 21, 22 at the time. And I thought, well, the world is my oyster, because everybody was making films. A lot of them were pretty shabby films, but they were films and it was work. You could get into films. You could do films. I did a James Bond film. I did a Dracula film. I was even in Coronation Street. I did a play down at Canterbury. I did a play in the West End. But somehow everything sort of evaded the grasp of being able to say, I'm an actress in work and it's marvellous, because I was skint. I was skint. I mean, I wasn't poor because Mahi... In my life, I know what poverty is. I've seen what real poverty is. And it's not what I was, because people like me are never poor. You can always scrabbage around and do something, you know? Mm -hmm. I could live off Marmite toast for, forever. That was no problem. Um, but I had no money and I had no kind of prospect of the future. And it wasn't really until the extraordinary casting for a show in those days called The New Avengers, where they were looking for a new Avenger girl. And it's hard to believe, but in those days, it was about as eagerly anticipated as a new James Bond. Who will be the new Avenger girl with Patrick McNee playing Steve? And I unbelievably managed to nail that part and get it. And so that is what changed my life because that's for the first time I had a part which people, whether they liked me or not, knew who I was. And so they would know, oh, Joanna Lumley, she was Purdy in the new Avengers. And I was 30. So that's how long it took, nine years of slogging along. One year I earned 60 pounds. I'd be really, really interested to know, based on this quite thrilling, but what sounds like a very, very difficult journey, how it is that you had the, the confidence and the willingness and the perseverance to just kind of keep going through all these challenges. What is it that drove you to, to push until you got this part that you wanted and that was a breakthrough for you when you were 30? Well, first of all, I love doing it. Secondly, I've always been an optimist. So hope springs eternal. I think, well, I didn't get that part because remember, you have to go up to countless auditions mm -hmm. and are turned down. And so actors have to develop a kind of hide of a rhinoceros because you're always being told, no, you're no good. No, we don't want you. No, you're not for us. And you have to go back and hold your head up high and go, never mind, it'll be okay. Never get bitter, never get resentful. Always, always do. I got used to accepting everything that was ever offered to me, no matter how humble or not really what I wanted to do. You know, I didn't really want to play a girlfriend who had two lines, but I thought, oh, but it's a job. It's a job, better to keep working. Um, I think that uh, the sense of optimism and hard work is what kept me going, not giving up. My father once said to me, never give up, never give up. And I would always remember, even on the darkest days, what my father said, and I thought, I won't give up. I will, I will hang on in here. And good luck is bound to strike at some stage. And it does, it does. But you've got to be there. You've got to be prepared. You've got to be ready, um, able to work, polite, vigorous, prompt, prepared, in that if you have lines to say, learn them all, get it right, you know, don't let people down. Don't keep people waiting. And so I think that's what probably helped me along. So after this year, this almost decade of struggle, you had your breakthrough with New Avengers. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to, ask, wanted to ask, what did this initial success feel like? What did it feel like to not be struggling anymore, to not kind of have to live off Marmite on toast anymore <laughs> at all times? Was it, was it what you expected? Did it have its own challenges? We filmed the New Avengers. We filmed 13 hour long episodes on film, which was like making the equivalent of, let's say, six feature films. No, actually we filmed 26 episodes. Mm -hmm. so it was like making 13 feature films in two years. Hard work. I was up first all the time. I never watched it when it came out because I was always working and I just never saw it. I thought, well, I know the stories. Why would I watch it? I was in it. I know the actors. I know what went on. So I never watched it. Um, gradually, I noticed changes in people in the streets or in shops who go, oh, 
look at you, are you? You look very like Joanna Lumley. Once I was queuing for bread, and not, not like a kind of beggar, but I was in the bread queue up at Crouch End. And <laughs> yes. Some nice people around me in the queue all went, oh, look who it is, it's Purdy. But a woman joined at the end of the queue and she said, oh, look at you, you look just like Joanna Lumley. I bet you wish you had her money. And the funniest thing was, was that although this was a real job, we were very poorly paid. So I was still in the red, I was still hand to mouth. And it wasn't until I got the job after that, which was called Sapphire and Steel, which your <laughs> grandparents might remember. It was a sort of science fiction show. It wasn't until then that I managed to get enough money to know that I could not always have to buy the cheapest cheese on the cheese counter, you know? That's the first time I ever got um, a feeling of s sort of security would be wrong. You're never secure as an actor, never. Um, because you may never work again. We all know that. The second a job is over, you may never work again. But at least I felt I've sort of got something and I know now that I've got this history behind me slightly. I've been purdy in the New Avengers, I've been sapphire and sapphire and steel, and it can only get better than this. And it did, it just went on and on and on. And since then, I think it would be fair to say that I've never been out of work. I've worked and worked and worked. I've done mm -hmm. theater and radio, I've done touring, I've done films and television series. Um, and now, more recently, I've done a lot of documentaries. I've done commercials. I've hosted things. I've visited things. I've done, I've done anything. I tend to say yes. My mother, my father said never give up. My mother said always say yes. <laughs> so between them, yeah. I've sort of done everything. <laughs> so moving on now to what you are best known for, which is your role on Absolutely Fabulous, which has made you a, le a legend and an icon in oh. the English acting scene. Um, at what point did you notice that you actually had gone from being just a famous person that someone recognised in the queues of the shop occasionally to someone who was admired and celebrated across the country for this one particular role and then for your acting talent in general? Well, you are so sweet to say admired because a lot of people thought I was Patsy and they go, oh, hello, Patsy. And then people, <laughs> people would come up and say, I'm Patsy and she's Adina when we go out. And then people would come up and say, my mother's like Adina and you're like Patsy. Um, you know, my aunt's like Patsy and they all go out and get, and people would dress up as us and gay boys would dress up looking wonderful with wonderful legs, looking far better as Patsy than I did. Um, but it had the most affectionate feeling because these two ghastly women, my ghastly women, Patsy and Adina, actually captured a kind of a spirit of don't careness that um, was very attractive in the country at the time. It was the first time we'd really been allowed to see a completely dysfunctional family, which was just very, very funny. And it had a glamour to it. The fashion world, which it was really sort of based in and around, PR and fashion, absolutely adored it. And they got the joke and laughed about it. And it started off, we thought, well, maybe people in the south of England might like it. Because mm -hmm. they at least know where Harvey Nicks is, what we mean by that. Mm -hmm. It's all sort of London based. But then it caught on in New York and then gradually it spread and it went across the world. It went to Zanzibar, it went to Japan, it went to Greece, it went to countries which we thought it would never approach. But the truth of it is, is that it's in the brilliance of Jennifer Saunders' writing. If something's well written and funny from the beginning, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter where it's set or who's doing it, it works. And that's why Abfab worked. And it was the greatest privilege in my life to do it because when we were rehearsing, we recorded it live in front of an audience every Friday night. So there was an audience sitting at the BBC and therefore it was like putting on a, a play and we were always under rehearsed and frantic to get it right. So we were quite jittery. But the, the waves of laughter where sometimes we almost had to stop filming because they were laughing so much. Sometimes we would start laughing. But in rehearsals, we used to just lie on the ground and cry with laughter. And it was one of the happiest times of my life. Really, really thrilling. And do you think this um, added dimension of performing in front of a live audience every Friday night added to your, your portfolio as an actor and added to what you thought you could do and pushed you? Very much so. Of course, I'd done a lot of stage plays mm -hmm. by then, so I, did, I do know what it's like working with an audience, both in comedy mm -hmm. and in dramas, in Ibsen and in Chekhov and things like this. Um, an audience is magic, and all actors will tell you that although quite often we become best known through the screen, um, either on film or on television, actually most actors learn their craft and are most rewarded by performing live in front of an audience. But um, being being on a television comedy is the strangest. It's like riding two horses, like a circus performer, when you're riding two horses, but you're standing with a foot on each side. 
the cameras are as close as you, our cameras are to us, Marie. Um, but the audience is sitting behind over there. So part of you instinctively wants to play to the audience as you would in the theatre. But the other part of you knows that as, an, as a screen actress, you've got to only act for the screen. So it's an odd one to ride because the danger is, to, is maybe to overact. When in actual fact, the camera can see the smallest raise of an eyebrow or glance. They can see that. And the audience watching on screens as well as watching us live. So it's an, it's an odd one. But it's like everything to do with performance arts. It's a craft you learn. Always, I've learned this, always watch what other people do and always learn from people around you. Learn from the lighting cameraman, see where the camera angles are. This was something that, strange enough, modeling, which is always considered mm -hmm. completely brainless. I was talking to Twiggy, one of the great, great legendary models of all time the other day. And we agreed that modeling taught us an awful lot about lighting, about cameras, never to be afraid of the camera. The camera is your friend. Um, and I think that has always stood us in good stead. Um, Everything you do, and this isn't just to do with acting, this is to do with life. Everything you do builds you up for whatever else you're going to do. So do everything, do as much as you can. I'm always afraid when people say, oh, I'm narrowing it down, I only do this or I only do that. Say yes to everything. Listen to my mother, <laughs> listen to my mother. She says, say yes, say yes, do it, do it. Just have a go at it. Um, I've always thought we were like trees. Because you know when you cut a tree and to tell its age, you look at the rings around it. Mm. Um, and you can see where, right at the beginning, it was only a little thin, thin sapling. Well, I believe that people are like that. In the middle of us is still the same little person who was a child. Inside me is still the seven-year-old on stage in Kuala Lumpur in my first part. But around that has gradually built my life. And so experience has gone into that, love, failure, success ambition, fear, everything has all grown up around it. So don't let anything bad into your life because it'll remain with you. So say sorry if you've done something wrong. Get rid of old hatreds. Make your tree a good tree. And then as it grows bigger and bigger and bigger and you get older and older, and when you're as old as me, you feel your tree and you can see it hasn't got any disease in it. And you hope you've sort of righted all the wrongs that might have happened in your life. So trees, Mahi, that's my big thing, trees. Which actually leads me very nicely to my next question, which is to ask um, actually about how you, when you think back to your early life growing up in various places around the world, your birthplace in India, do you think that these places um, are still a part of you as you are on stage, as you are in front of the camera and you act? And do you think you bring memories and experiences of these places to your performances? I think without a shadow of doubt, I think... I think where you first draw breath is important. It sounds a bit like woo hippie-ish, but you are breathing in that second, the first gasp of a baby, whether it's in a hospital or not, but where you are. I was born in a nursing home on the shores of the Dal Lake in Srinagar in Kashmir, which is about as beautiful a place as you could ever, and it was peaceful then, it's in, in tragic um, disharmony at the moment, but it, it, it's sen sensational. And I have a feeling that that in itself was a blessing to be born amongst beauty. I think that every country I've been to, crowded countries, the long trips we did by, by sea on the old troop ships, which were old tin vessels, they didn't have anything lovely like swimming pools or anything, they were just old tin ships. It took a month at sea to get out to Singapore. It took five weeks to get out to Hong Kong. And my very first sea journey coming back from Mumbai, Bombay as it was then, to Liverpool, that took about three and a half weeks. And I think all those things of learning how to manage being on, on board a ship when all you can see is the sea around you, sometimes a porpoise, sometimes the stars at night, but mostly nothing, nothing, nothing. All this builds into you and it brings to you a, f a feeling of fatness, of replenishment. And so when you've got a part, whether it's Madame Ranievskaya in the cherry orchard, who's come back from Paris to her collapsing little farmhouse and estate in Russia, which is falling apart because she's done nothing to it and she's not listening to all the people who are saying, it's all gonna change, life is changing. Say, no, 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 no. And I think back to all the times in my life when I've been a bit careless and thought, no, 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 it'll be all right. 
was I listening? So I think I'll make Madame Ranevskaya like that. Well, she's very flippity but doesn't care. She remembers Paris. She thought she was gorgeous, turning her eyes away from the hardship that's about to face her. Mm -hmm. And so everything we do, you can bring it in. However, I go back to this, nothing in performance can survive a bad script. If the writing is good, it will be good. If the writing's bad, no amount of money, no amount of star names can redeem it. So the first thing you ever look for, and the first, the biggest prize, I think, should always go to the writer. The actors come far down the list, far down the list. So turning now to, um, to your work beyond acting, to your work as an activist, mm. uh, Throughout your career, you've always, always had a fight or a cause, and you've always been a part of a movement. So I wanted to start off by asking, was this activism and this desire to change the world always something that was a part of you, or was it something you picked up along the way? I think a lot of, a lot of the, the good things that have happened to me have, have come from having a wonderful and blessed upbringing. I had parents who believed so strongly in things and my mother was she could not stand bullying and she said early early on to me when I was about eight or nine I went to boarding school here in England which was a wrench suddenly to be without your parents and at a boarding school but she said don't let if anybody's bullied you go and stand up for them and smash them she was quite tough smash them do not take she said take the side of the person who's being bullied and make sure that you never see any kind of bullying so all the things that in my grown-up life I've been invited to help with um, is actually trying to prevent a kind of extended bullying, mm -hmm. unfairness, um, people who've got or creatures or something that's got no voice to speak up for it or is too weak to speak for itself. So I've tried to embrace causes which truly do need some kind of maybe a voice and quite often in the press, they will listen to a voice that's known rather than a solitary voice because people who are unknown are speaking all the time. They're the greatest activists in the world. But if you want to get your project into a paper, have a well-known face or a well-known voice. And that's why people get celebrities involved into charities because they know that if a celebrity, if somebody marvelous like Martin Clunes or Stephen Fry, or you know, Juliet Stevenson is involved, then the, then the press will go, hmm, that sounds interesting. Let's go and follow that and have a look at what they're saying. And so this is where fame, which is worth nothing, I must tell you, except that. And that is a very precious side of fame. If you can bring your fame to shine its light on the right causes, then it's worth something. And one of the most prominent ways and causes for which you've done that has been the Gurkha Justice Campaign. So I just wanted to give you a moment to talk a bit about the work that you've done for this campaign. Explain to our listeners what this campaign was and what it stood for and what its aims were and how it is that you achieved these aims. In about 2008, I think it was, a man called Peter Carroll, who was uh, a Folkestone town councillor, and in Folkestone were a lot of, uh, it's, it's got a big Gurkha encampment there and big Nepali influence. He realized that a lot of Gurkha soldiers once they'd finished their long and devoted tour of duty to the British Army, because they've always been part of the British Army for 200 years, mm -hmm. they were just immediately exiled from England as if they were criminals, sent straight back to Nepal, straight back to Nepal. They weren't allowed to rest and remain and reside here as all the other Commonwealth troops were. And the truth is, is that Nepal was never part of the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. and therefore, it slipped through a crack through various <coughs> governments over the years, who all just would kind of kick this problem into the long grass. The Gurkhas had been sort of left aside, overlooked. It was something somebody else will deal with that later, later, later. And Peter came to me with three human rights lawyers and said, we need the face. And it just so happens that I am a daughter of the regiment. I am a Gurkha soldier's daughter. And so it fitted in properly because it wasn't as though I was parachuted into something which I knew nothing about. I was a daughter of the regiment. And so the five of us started, it started off with just the five of us meeting on pavements, outside pubs, writing to each other late at night on email. All of us had sort of day jobs and were working anyway, but we were determined to swing it round so that Gurkhas would have the right, if they wanted to, to remain here, to get their children schooled here, because although schooling is getting better in Nepal, it's 
very substandard compared to the rest of the world. And the Gurkha soldiers who've been fighting for Britain all this time, laying down their lives, earning VCs, dying in their thousands for Britain. Why should they be treated so differently? They paid their taxes here. They should have had a chance to have their children at least educated here. And that's what we wanted to do. And that's what it was justice for the Gurkhas to allow them, if they wanted to, to stay here and have their children schooled here. And if, if necessary, Frankly, no, but none of them wanted to become British citizens. They're all proud Nepali citizens. And most of them want to return home at the end of their lives because Nepal is their home. We are their second home, but Nepal is their home. And so we fought and fought and we took, it was like a strange dance, Mahi. We would take two steps forward and one step back and then one step forward and three steps back. And we fought on and on, but we made a vow between the five of us that we would never stop until we had got justice for the Gorkas. And it happened, it, it happened by the great goodness of Gordon Brown, who was the prime minister at the time, who we never could get to see. We were blocked and blocked, we were blocked by the Home Office, we were blocked by the Ministry of Defence. Meetings went unresolved and letters went unanswered. Finally, through some clever manoeuvring, I managed to have an audience with the prime minister then, who has since become a, a close personal friend, a fine, fine man, integrity shining out of him and it was all once i'd met him it was all resolved within about six weeks it was fantastic and so it was just um a dream of course there are a lot of anomalies which go with it which are to do with pensions we vowed well we had to make a promise to the government then that we would not then continue to do anything to do with with gurkha pensions which were always graduated at a different scale they could start earlier they would get less, but it would go on for longer, you know, and it's a nightmare. So they said, do not come near pensions. Mm -hmm. So we've had to keep our arms folded and not be involved with the pensions. But at least we've got the right for Gurkhas to remain here and to get their children educated here. Because education, and this speaking to you, my lovely brainy girl, education is the most important thing on the planet, on the planet. I never went to university, but luckily my parents had taught me, they said, if you can read, if you can read properly and understand reference books and have a sense of true curiosity, you can teach yourself anything. Mm -hmm. So everything I've learned in my life, which is lots and I'm very old, I've learned through reading, grabbing stuff, reading it, asking people, reading, finding out, sourcing it, reading, comparing things. So education, that's the most important thing. And so some of the things that I try to help with nowadays are, is education in faraway lands which haven't got a hope. It might, might be in the middle of Africa, it might be in far-flung villages in Nepal or Bhutan or wherever, you know, education. Talk to us about some of these experiences in these far-flung regions and, 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 and any instances of tangible change that you've seen um, in the way we can change education and education provision to those who need it most. It's, well, it's, it's money and it's people with with true goodness in their souls. Now there's an extraordinary family called the Sellers family who set up something called Kadzinuni, which was supporting a little African village. They'd been there once on a holiday. They were stricken by how the children would long for even a pencil, even just a little magazine or anything. They didn't have books, they didn't have pencils. So this extraordinary family set up a foundation called the Friends of Kadzinuni and they asked me to be its patron and our symbol is a giraffe. Mm -hmm. And they literally built schools and built little Kadzanuni up um, where it had no education and no kind of uh, hospital center or anything like that. They simply built up this little village. They poured all their life savings and energy and help. They went out there all the time. And I love small endeavors because quite often you can follow them. I know the people, I know the people who run orphanages and and rescue centers for girls in nepal and schools in nepal i'm part of a proud setup of a of a school up in tipliang which is up in the, ooh, far off the beaten track in nepal in memory of my father and two other gurkhas um these are the things we can do you can't take on the whole world but what you can do is to find a little place and know that all the money you can give will actually go into buying well it used to be 
just pencils and paper and books, but it can also be laptops. This is why I love Book Aid International, because they're getting books out to countries which can't get books. They're desperate to read, they're longing to read, and as soon as they get an electric light bulb, and as soon as they can learn to spell out the letters, the children are hungry for learning. So those are the places that I love to help. So I guess my next question relates to how you safeguard these communities, these vulnerable communities that you're helping. Um, how do you safeguard them from the pandemic that we face today? And how do you make sure that once there are vaccines and preventative measures in place, that these do actually reach out to them? Well, there's another brilliant charity called Kids for Kids, and it's in Darfur, which is one of the most benighted regions in Sudan in the world. It's absolutely forgotten. It's been well, there was a huge famine there years ago, long before you were born, and, but then it slipped off the map and nobody was interested and it was difficult to get to, extremely dangerous. Sudan was in a troubled time, you couldn't get there. This extraordinary woman called Patricia Parker went out then, she started off Kids for Kids, which was to bring, first of all, goats, literally, little goats, kids, so that a family could make milk. They would have the goat, which would have babies, they could sell the little goats on and milk and get milk good for the children. Then we set up schools there and set up um, midwives and also animal husbandry and water. And what Patricia Parker is doing now, she's got this great campaign in Kids for Kids, which is to get soap, literally bars of soap out to Darfur. Because once the epidemic reaches there, the pandemic, what can they do? I mean, it is very, very far away, but we know how vulnerable they are because for a start, they're already frail. They're underfed and undernourished. Um, we've been getting, trying to get water there, but the government is still very difficult. It's very difficult to get to Darfur. Mm -hmm. And they're sort of cut off. It's a hard region to visit or to protect, if anybody even wants to protect it. So you can't, all you can do is your best. You should never, ever stop trying. And so even if all you can do is send one bar of soap, mm -hmm. send it even if all you can do is send five pounds to something which says it's going to try to help, do send it, do try. I'm a great believer in these charities because you can look at their kind of, you know, those cake charts when they put slices of how much they spend on advertising or whatever. All the good ones have just a sliver of how much they spend on administration and that much on actually what they do. So look for the ones that actually do masses on the ground and then support them. But I don't know how we, I, nobody in the world seems to know what to do about this pandemic. So we just live, pray, hope, wash, smile. Which leads me very nicely onto my last question, which I guess is just to ask, are you optimistic about the world ahead, not just kind of for the UK and for the industry after the pandemic, but also for movements and vulnerable people around the world? And do you think there is hope for all our futures in, in the next, few months, few years? few months, we've just got to keep watching to see what happens, whether it comes back again in countries which have declared themselves open and ready for business and whether it does come back in a second wave. So we've just got to be very, very careful. I'm in the old brigade, Mahi. Mm -hmm. I'm one of the oldest. I'm terrified they're going to lock me in. And so I keep dyeing my hair yellow and <laughs> <laughs> running down the stairs to show that I'm, although I'm old, I'm still okay. But the most important thing is, funnily enough, is not this plague which is affecting us, which is ghastly beyond words. We're focusing on that. It's actually the state of the world. Go to David Attenborough, listen to what David Attenborough is saying. He's saying, we are literally teetering on the brink. If we don't do something now at once, there will be no world for us to live in. So we've got to look at that. We've got to look at how the ice, cap, ice caps are melting. We've got to look now as I'm sitting in London, as I'm speaking to you, and you're up in Oxford, I guess. No, where are you? Are you in Oxford? Where are you? I'm at home in Milton Keynes. You're in Milton Keynes. But if you look outside, Mahi, I know you'll see what I'm seeing, which is a blazing blue sky. And it's only blazing blue because there's nothing happening. There are no aeroplanes up there. There are no cars. So somehow we've got to, to treat this whole thing with the greatest respect um, we've been smacked on the knuckles really hard and really tragically for so many people. But we've got to learn from it. We've got to learn that you cannot have these ghastly wet markets where wild creatures are sold live and, and mm -hmm. sold to be eaten in squalid conditions with ultimate cruelty. 
We've got to stop these hateful practices. We've got to learn what nature's telling us. And nature here is saying, look how beautiful it all can be. Look how it can be if you only try. And so we've got to stop doing some of the things that seem to be great, like flying to Iceland for two days for a stag party. Mm-hmm. Don't do it, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Go down to the old bull and bush, and have a few pints <laughs> there if you want to. But don't keep flying around to do useless things. Don't drive, 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 try to walk, try to cycle, or maybe just do without it. Maybe we don't need all those things. A lot of people are shopping online. I love meeting people, so we want to be able to walk. But maybe think about where the thing, just think a bit more about the world, think about it. And if you have to do without, well, we're all being taught how to do without now. And it's quite a good lesson for us all, how to do without the things we usually do. So when we come back into the open world again, which we will, if our governments around the world don't start blaming each other as to who's done what Mm -hmm. rightly or wrongly. If we get through this, we as people must learn to take responsibility for ourselves, for our families, for those we know, and to do better. It's like the headmasters come in and bang the desk lid and said, Mm -hmm. listen, everybody, you've got to do better or you're all going to be kept in forever. Great. Thank you so much, Joanna. One final question from our members. Yeah. Um, this one is from Viren at Christchurch, who um, would, who's asking, you worked extensively with Dawn French and Jennifer Saunders on Abfab. Could you talk to us about these experiences and the importance of female figures in comedy? Well, of course, French and Saunders were just magic. And Ruby Wax, who was also one of the great, one of my greatest heroes, and these are all greatest, dearest friends, but I worked first with Ruby Wack, who said, well, you ought to work with French and Saunders. I think you should work with, work with me first. So I did some very funny stuff with Ruby Wax first. And then with um, Jennifer, because she really, she wrote and she was the sort of protagonist of um, Absolutely Fabulous. Dawn, who's just heaven. But these are bold women. They're younger than me. And they had a kind of boldness about their own abilities, which I never had. I was always a bit kind of, maybe I shouldn't have said that, or maybe I shouldn't push myself forward. But they had a kind of courage and confidence that has just made them extraordinary. They set up companies. I've never had a company. They set up a company. They'd have French and Saunders. That's why at the end of AbFab, you always see French and Saunders. It's by Saunders and French. Not me. (laughs) (laughs) They were wise enough and smart enough to do it. I couldn't love them more. And I think that female empowerment is one of the things which we're going to have to see in the future. Because... It's funny to think that in this country, it's only, it's not even a hundred years since women got the vote. And even when I took my first flat, shared with three other girls in Earl's Court in the 1960s, we weren't allowed to sign the lease. We had to get a man because women are too, couldn't sign a lease. Well, this has changed in my lifetime and I hope it's going to change much, much more. Um, I see no division between women and men. I've got friends, women, men, and everything in between with the LGBTQ plus community, everybody in the world, we shouldn't be seen as different or lesser, any of us. We're exactly the same and completely different. But women need empowering, particularly in the developing world. So that's where we've got to turn our eyes. We've got to enable them. We've got to get them into education. And they've got to know that we are their sisters and we love them dearly and we're always there for them. Thank you so much, Joanna. That is a really warm and wonderful note to end on. Um, And yeah, I just want to say a massive, massive thank you for being a part of our podcast. It's been a pleasure to host you. Thank you. It's been absolutely lovely. And thank you so, so much.